Hey friends, it's your pal Mike Shea. Today, we are going to talk about Albert Rodeo, Albert Rodeo, specifically Albert Rodeo 2.0. Albert Rodeo is a free or subscription-based service to offer you a virtual tabletop that you can use for any tabletop role-playing game. It can support Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, uh, it can support Shadow Dark, it can support any different kind of RPG. Anytime you want a map and tokens and Fog of War, Albert Rodeo has you covered. It also has a ton of other features, but we're not going to spend too much time talking about those other features. Instead, the purpose of today's video is to help lazy DMs and lazy GMs use Albert Rodeo quickly and efficiently to be able to drop maps and tokens in front of your players very quickly. In fact, so quickly that my goal for the video is that when I'm done with it and after you've spent some time with Albert Rodeo, you should be able to add a new map and get tokens on those maps and set up a fog of war during the game. That I I believe Albert Rodeo is actually a really good improvisational tool that by the time you realize you need something in front of the players to either manage combat or to show them a dungeon that you didn't plan on, that you can actually take just a couple of minutes to get a map up and running with Fog of War with some tokens on it without having to do anything else so that you can actually use it during the game. That's one of the key features to me of Albert Rodeo. This video, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of really good, exclusive stuff. Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, a preview of the City of Arches source book, a dedicated Discord server, a monthly Q&A, and a whole lot more. To the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you so much for helping me put together videos like this. My goal for this video is to focus on the, the specific features of Albert Rodeo that make it easy to set up and easy to go. This is a video specifically for lazy DMs and lazy GMs. You can find all different kinds of advanced tutorials on how to use Albert Rodeo from Mitch and Nicole, the two developers of Albert Rodeo, on the Albert Rodeo YouTube channel. So I will link to that so you can go take a look at their tutorial videos. They have like advanced features for setting up uh, attaching tokens together for really advanced fog of war, all that kind of stuff. But we're going to focus on the basics here. The basics to get you up and running very quickly. That's and that's important. Now, there's some things this video is not going to do and things that I do not intend for this video to do. One, I'm not going to show you every single feature that Albert Rodeo 2.0 has. I'm not going to show you all of the ways it can be expanded. I'm not going to show you all of the advanced stuff of Albert Rodeo. We're focusing just on specifically getting a map up and running with Fog of War and getting some tokens on it. Uh, I'm not here to convince you that Albert Rodeo is better than any other VTT. You might be watching this video saying, oh, I like Fantasy Grounds. I like Foundry. I like Shard. I like Roll20. I like all these other ones. I like the Maps tool and d Beyond. Cool. I'm not saying it's better than any of those. I'm not saying you should stop using those and come over and start using this. I am specifically showing you what capabilities this particular VTT has. I'm not saying it's better than anything else. I'm not even saying that it's the best thing ever. There's definitely little quirky bits with Albert Rodeo that you either have to get used to and that can be vexing. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I really like it. I, it is my favorite virtual tabletop of choice, which is why I'm talking about it. I also think it is an underappreciated tool because there's tons and tons of people using Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, and Foundry. But why do I like Albert Rodeo? What is it about Albert Rodeo that draws me in? And there's a couple of things. One is the speed of its use. It is very easy for me to get a map up and running very quickly and get it in front of my players. It doesn't require players needing to log in. It can be use, It's usable on a mobile device, so people on phones can use it. There's you know, it's got it's got all the features that I need in order to get to run. And some of the advanced features I do use the idea of attaching tokens to an object, like having a bunch of tokens on a boat and then moving the boat along and the boat moves and all the tokens move with it. It's got features like that. Those are kind of advanced features that take a little time and it can be a little nitpicky to figure out. But it does the basic features, in my opinion, very, very well. It's also system agnostic. It's not tied to any one platform. You're not buying modules that you import into this one tool. The investment is very low. It has a free tier. It also has monthly and yearly rates if you want more storage and you want to add more rooms and a little bit more customization but a lot of that is really if you're using it a lot i'm using it a lot so i pay for a yearly subscription for it but it's not like i'm buying a bunch of extra stuff and then if i decide i need to go to another virtual tabletop i lose everything all i'm paying for is that subscription so i'm not locked in like i'd be locked in if i decided to go whole hog into roll 20 or fantasy grounds or foundry where you buy a lot of modules and now you own those modules in that platform and now if you want to leave it would cost you hundreds to thousands of dollars to move over to another platform 
platform because of all the stuff you bought on one platform or the other. This is a completely agnostic tool. It, there's lots of things it doesn't do. It doesn't have built-in voice communication. It doesn't have video chat. It doesn't have full rules integration. And these to me are bonuses. These are pluses because I don't mind having a separate tool that sits on the side while I do other things in Discord or I use tools at my table. It's one component of a stack. And to me, that makes it really valuable. And it also means I can use it with lots of other tools. I can play Numenera. I can use Blades in the Dark, Shadow Dark RPG. I've used it with all of these different these different game systems. So it's usable for pretty much any role-playing game where you want to drop a map and some tokens. Albert Rodeo had a big change in the last year where they switched over from uh, Albert Rodeo 1.0 and switched over to 2.0. And this was a really big change. And for people I know who loved Albert 1.0, they had a hard time moving to 2.0. They don't like, there's a lot of things about 2.0 they don't like. One of the goals I have this video is for those people that used Albert 1.0 but haven't really dug into 2.0 or are frustrated with it, maybe I can show a few things that might make it a little bit easier. I'm not probably going to convince you that it's better than 1.0 because there are a lot of other features in 2.0 that add to the complexity. And one of the beauties of Albert 1.0 was that it was really simple. And I ran it a lot during the beta. I I ran it early beta and then later in beta and eventually in the the later ends of the beta of 2.0 is when I switched over completely and stopped using 1.0. There were enough features that I was using regularly that I stopped using 1.0. So I got very used to using 2.0, which means for me it's very easy. But for people who made that switch recently, particularly when 1.0 stopped working, that's frustrating. When you had something you you used to like and it disappears, that can be very frustrating. I don't have an answer to that. There's there's not anything where I can say, hey, you should just like this more. I'm not saying that. But maybe I can show you something that's easy. But what are some of the differences between 1.0 and 2.0? As a, if you have used Albert Rodeo before, what are the main differences between that and now? The big one is it's a it's a hosted service now that uh, Mitch and Nicole who run Albert Rodeo, they are running a server. They were running it before too. The weird bit was they were basically passing the application down to your browser your browser was creating the connections out to other users and that meant there was weird performance things sometimes it meant that it was easier for people to drop connections it was all kinds of odd bits that would happen when it was this weird sort of a downloaded client in your browser that you didn't know was there that was actually connecting out now it is a fully hosted service you go there it's hosted on their side speed is bump it means things that like when you drag a token everybody sees the token moving around where albert 1.0 had to wait until it, it stopped before it would show you what was going on So little things like that, but it's a completely hosted service now. It does require that the GM has an account with Albert Rodeo. You can log in with Google, you can log in with other IDs, but you can also create your own account. I actually created a dummy account for the video today to show what's going on. But it, you have to log in. You have to create a login. Now, you have to log in. That doesn't mean your players have to log in. On the player side, I feel like it is almost as easy to use Albert 2.0 as it was to use 1.0. There's some new features that players might have to get used to, but they don't have to create an account. They don't have to log in. Instead, what happens is when if, if they are completely anonymous, you can ex- the GM has to say, yeah, I'm going to let this person in. That way, you don't have like a bunch of randos coming in, jumping in your map if somehow they got the URL. They don't have to create an account, though. They can jump right in. It created two new metaphors and this is where the complexity went up and I know when it first saw it I was like oh this is making things harder Uh, and that's the concept of rooms and scenes and we're going to talk more about this as we go rooms are essentially like you can imagine having a room or a table for one particular campaign that way you could have multiple campaigns going on and have your assets and everything separated by campaign so I had a Shadow Dark one I had a Empire of the Ghouls one I had a Scarlet Citadel one I had a Shadow Keep in the Borderlands one I can have my campaign separate I know my maps are in those different ones I know that they're all set up. If I have maps that are in play, that map will stay in play. So those are your, your, you can think of your rooms like your campaigns. Your scenes are like individual maps. What are the individual maps that I'm going to have? And you can have different maps and you can even have tokens laid out on maps and save those so that if you want to go back to them, you still have those in play. So there's, there's advantages to having that, but it does add a level of complexity. When I start diving into how to use it, you'll see more about this. Uh, there's a whole lot of differences in how you handle maps and tokens, fog of war, other you know, shapes, mounts, and other things. The asset management of Albert 2.0 is definitely more complicated than 1.0 was, and I think that's an area where people are getting stuck, and we're going to talk about that. It is definitely more complex, but one, once you understand the core features, I would feel, and I, I could be wrong on this because it's been a while since I used 1.0, I feel like it's close to the simplicity that Albert 1.0 had. You can you can streamline things enough. I have been able to streamline things enough that it's just as fast for me to get a map 
wrap up and running with tokens in Albert 2 as it was with 1. But the other one is 1 is gone. We don't have 1 anymore. That's not quite true. There's a way that you can self-host 1. Trust me, most people are not going to want to try to self-host it. But it is available if you wanted to self-host it. But most people are going to want to move to 2. So if you're happy with 1 and 1 is gone and now you're sad, the be- and, but you still want to use it, my recommendation is that taking some time to understand how Albert 2 does what it does uh, is going to be a benefit to you. So let's dive in. Now we're going to talk about what you actually need to do. There's some things you need to do up front. And once you do these things, you can do these at any time. Once you've done these things, then they're, they're done and established, and then you generally don't have to worry about them again. So the first one is you've got to make an account. So you go to your Albert Rodeo, Albert, Albert.rodeo, link is in the show notes, of course, uh, and you can click on sign up or play, play for free. Play for free takes you to a sign up page where you sign up with either an email address, but you can also log in with Google or Apple if you happen to be on an Apple device. Uh, my main account is through Google, but uh, I created a fake account, a brand new account, for this video. So I log in. This is a brand new account that I created yesterday just to show what it looks like when you have had put when you put nothing in uh, and it gives you a very basic set. This is a free account. So there is free accounts basically limit you to two rooms. You are not able to customize the name of the room and you have a limited amount of storage for things like maps. For most people, if you are happy with what Albert Wano did, this is really all you need because you could just have all your maps in one room. You can keep your assets thin, delete all the assets that you're not using and probably run with this for a while. I was running enough different games that to me having multiple rooms and being able to name those rooms differently was worth upgrading. Uh, the costs are very low. I'm doing the fledgling. Uh, I think I paid for a full year, three dollars and four, you know, three thirty three a month, six sixty six a month. Nice. Uh, if you really want to have, you know, twenty five room, twenty five rooms is bananas. Like, I don't know who needs ten gigabytes of storage for maps and twenty five rooms. That that seemed like a lot. So we don't have any room yet. So we're creating a room again. A room is like a table. Imagine a room being your game, whatever game you're going to run. So you create a new one. Now you can't, if you if you have the free tier, you can't change the name of the room. Obviously it's very useful to be able to change the name of the room. There are also extensions. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about extensions quite yet because you can add extensions later. So for now, we're just gonna fire up a room. Uh, this image, this background image here, you can actually randomize it to kind of pick one that you think fits the style of the game that you're going to run and hit create. So now you've got a room. And if you go back to your Albert Rodeo, for example, and you, lo- and you go back to login, you will see that you have the rooms and you can click on it. This one is apparently called the model face. And right now I have an empty room. This is when you start getting into scenes, right? This is when you want to first start up a scene. Now the scenes will be per map. So each map that you're going to use for a particular scene. So think of a scene like a map and remember that in your room, in your group of your D&D games, in your particular campaign that you're running, you might have multiple maps that you're going to set up. You don't have to set them up all ahead of time, though, because remember, we're, we're going this for, for a lazy feature. So to create a new scene, one thing I don't do is I don't worry about the maps uh, tab here. This is kind of that this this asset management is a new thing that they've added recently. I don't worry about that. I just go to scenes and I click on add. Now, it has these things called starter sets, and you probably want to add the starter sets. The starter sets are all of these basic maps that you could use just when you want to have a background for throwing some tokens on there so that you can show players and monsters roughly where they are in an area. So I go in here, I go into the starter set, I click on add all, and now all those maps are now in my scenes. I have those handy if I ever need them. So this is that, you know, when we talk about being usable for improvisational play, if I want to quickly... Uh, set up a scene where we're kind of in a dungeon. I can just do it and I've got my scene and I'm ready to go. I have a map ready to go. I don't have to think about anything else. So now we have a bunch of default scenes. But of course, you want to add a map of your own. So I'm switching the view so we have a little bit more room to see the maps and see everything that we're we're going to here. So we're going back to our room. Again, it's called the model face because that's the default name. You pay for it. You can actually edit the name. We go in there. Now it went back to the default map that I've got, but I want to create one for a dungeon. So I'm going to go in here, I click, uh, and so I'm in the atlas, in the scenes, I click add for my new map, 
click on upload, and I'm going to upload a Dyson logo map. One thing is the Dyson logo maps, when you download them directly from Dyson, uh, from DysonLogos.com, uh, they come as pings that are really, really high resolution, but smaller in size. I convert them to a larger size JPEGs because they operate a lot better. They're, they're, for some reason, they're much faster. The rendering speed and stuff is faster. So that's really if you're losing, using Dyson Logos maps. Uh, you want to take note that you probably want to convert the ping to a JPEG before you import into Albert Rodeo because... Albert Rodeo seems to like JPEGs better. And those pings, there's something about the rendering size of those pings that makes them kind of weird for, for virtual, I, I think for lots of virtual tabletops beyond just Albert Rodeo. So now we have our map. We're, we're beginning to load the map. Now here's the real lazy trick. This is important. Prepare for a really important lazy trick. It is also a trick that some amount of you Maybe a lot of you, maybe most of you are going to immediately scoff and say, that's not how we can do it. But trust me, this is the true lazy trick. Don't worry about the grid. Don't worry about the grid. Don't try to line it up perfectly. Don't try to make sure it's exactly the right size that you need. Don't turn on grid snapping and don't show the grid on the map itself. I know it's driving you bananas, but no, we got to have grid at play. There are other ways to measure distances between objects in Albert Rodeo that I'll show you, but by trying to nitpick it down to the point where you're trying to make sure that the map fits the grid perfectly, it's going to take you so much more time. And it is so much faster to just do just do this. And what you do is in here, we're going to call this Dyson map. This is on our little menu on the right. We turn off snapping. That way the token is not trying to snap itself to the grid. We get rid of that. We also turn off the opacity. We do not want to see the grid on the map itself. Now this can, you, you want to do this even if the map that you're loading has a grid on it. You still want to turn these things off because that way the players can focus on the grid that's on the map, not on the grid that's being snapped to by Albert Rodeo. So turn off snapping, lower the opacity. Those, those are two big ones. Now, the other thing you can do, and if you look in here, we're actually going to turn the, the opacity up on the grid just so we can see roughly what it is while we're preparing to make sure that the map is the right size. So if you look at this, and you can see that like the grid is not lining up with this hall. You could spend all day trying to perfectly line up the map, and it does have tools to do that. If you're really, really nitpicky, you can do that. That is not a lazy GM technique. That is a, that is a non-lazy technique. We're here for the lazy. We want to do it fast, particularly we want to do it so we can load a map so quickly that we can do it in the middle of our game. And I'm going to show that. I'll show what that's like. So instead we say, well, do we really want five foot square hallways for this? That seems awfully narrow. That means your characters are going to be there. It means if you have a large monster, they're going to take up a ton of room. So a lot of times what I do with these maps is I double the size of the grid. I want it to actually be twice as big as what it needs to be. So in this case, it says it's 32. I'm going to turn it to 64. And now you look... And the hallways are about two squares wide. Again, the grid doesn't line up. I don't care. But the nice thing there is now the map has gotten a lot bigger. It means there's a lot more room for characters to move through these hallways. It means if you have large monsters, the large monsters are going to work. So I just doubled the columns. All I said was, was make it twice the size that it normally is. Then I turn my opacity off. And one other important feature is down in the lower right, we have fog controls. This tells us, does it already start with the fog enabled? I'm going to start with the fog enabled because that tends to be when you're using a big map like this, you're only exposing certain parts of the map when the characters are there. It's far easier to say, fog, fog it. Start it fogged, and I'll, un I'll unfog it when we need. You can decide whether or not you want the whole map to be visible or whether you want the whole map to be fogged. If you're doing like a battle arena where they already see everything, it might be that you want to have the whole thing visible. But if you want to hide parts of it, and that's really one of the reasons why we're using virtual tabletop is to hide it, you want to have the fog controls enabled. And then you click import. It takes a little bit of time for it to kind of build everything together, throws it in your new maps, and as soon as it's done, you can click into it and show the map. So here we go. Now I have this Dyson map. I'm going to click on it. It opens it up and I've got a map. So I now have two things. One, I've loaded a map. Two, I've already put Fog of War on that map. But now I need the other big aspect, which are tokens. I need to get tokens. Again, there's a thing we're going to do right now that you only have to do once. Once you've done it, it's done. And once you have them, you'll have them for every other game, which again speeds things up. And that's having the default character tokens for Albert Rodeo. It doesn't load them automatically. When you click on the tokens list, you get different props, mounts, characters, attachments, and notes. We're on characters. We're going to click add. And again, we have a starter set, characters and monsters, the starter set, double click that, say add all, 
and now you've got all of the tokens. And you'll immediately see at the bottom of my screen now, I have all of those tokens that I just added. These are the default tokens that I have here. So now I can have, for example, my wizard and my fighter. We'll have a barbarian and we'll use a little shield for our cleric. So now we've got some tokens. Now, of course, you can add your own tokens too. We'll talk about that. Here's another lazy trick for you, it's important. The default tokens are fine. You don't need to add special tokens for every single monster you're gonna throw in here. Pick one of the default tokens, give it a name, throw it in there, and you're done. Very, very easy to do, very fast. When we're talking about using Owlbear Rodeo for improvised play, the, one, of the, the, one of the big features I talked about, don't worry about snapping to the grid, don't worry about showing a grid, and use the default tokens are all ways to make this whole thing much faster, much easier. Now, Fog of War. Fog of War is the big other feature that we're using on this. So one of the things you want to do with the Fog of War, you have this cloud icon and you want to subtract. So you say, you, you, you want to make sure the scissors do not have a slash through them. You want the, the scissors should be open. That means you're cutting away the fog. And you have these different shapes that you can use to cut away the fog. We're going to use a rectangle and we're going to say they can see this whole chamber. We're going to cut there and then you can overlap multiple Fogs of War so that you can show just that chamber. If you want to see what it looks like for the players, you can click this enable fog preview, that's the little eye with the slash, and it shows you what they can see. It takes away everything but what the, what the players can see when you've revealed that fog of war. Uh, that way they go into a new room, you say, okay, the characters have moved over, they open this door, the wizard goes first, of course, right? Cleric is gonna be behind, fighter, barbarian is still, he's, he got lost in this alcove right? Uh, Barbarian doesn't know where he's going. You want to reveal that. You use the little rectangle and you show the next room. Bang. Right? Now you can see that they're, they're, they're opening it up. Now, of course, you get some weird ones like this big hot dog looking hallway here, right? This one with the two statues. And you're like, ah, oh. now you can, and I've done this, just use squares. You don't have to use all the fancy tools. You can just line up a bunch of squares and, you know, show, you know, have it, have it reveal what it needs, what needs to be revealed. You don't have to be real particular about using special tools, but there are, you can definitely like do a circular room by going here and drawing a circle and opening up that, right? You can, uh, you have this polygon tool where you can draw the picture of what you want. And it's worth playing with these to kind of see how they work. Right. That way you can draw a shape right around, uh, right around what you want, but also just use squares, use the easiest tool, use the simplest tool to get the job done. That's my opinion. Now, Albert Rodeo and one of the tutorials talks about this. Albert Rodeo has really fancy ways to draw individual blocks of your fog of war that you can turn on and off, which means you can essentially set up the fog of war for your entire map ahead of time and just reveal things when they need to be revealed. There's a really good tutorial that shows how to do that. It's super nitpicky and it takes a lot of time. Thus, it is not appropriate for our discussion about using our rodeo for lazy GMs. This is, this is key. So now we're pretty well set, right? We have, we have what we need. We have characters. The, let's say they go into this big chamber here and they're like, hey, we want to go. What's up? The barbarian caught up with them finally. Right. And it's time for them to fight a Tarrasque. Oh, I don't have a Tarrasque. Oh, where's the Tarrasque? No problem. I'll drop in this dragon. Oh, it's so small. Click the icon. You can make it as big as you want. You can be like, there's my, there's my Tarrasque. Now the players, now the, the players can see it. You forget, again, if you want to go to the cloud view and click on the fog enable, you can see what they can see and they can realize, wow, we walked into a chamber where there's a Tarrasque. How about that? Very, very straightforward. So now that we have seen how to kind of get everything set up, we're going to do another map because now we've got things set up. We have our room. We have our scenes with the tokens. The default tokens are already set. We figured out our basic stuff. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other features that it has. We're not, again, we're not going to dig into a lot of the advanced features, but there are things like if you do have a map and you want to figure out distance and you're not using a grid, you have the measure tool, which can measure the distance between things. I run with abstract maps, so I don't really focus on distances, but if people want to figure things out, you can definitely use that tool. The laser pointer uh, is a good one for other, if you want, you and your players to be able to see what's going on. You can use the laser pointer to highlight certain areas to your players. Again, it's all done dynamically. Uh, there is the group select. This is handy if you're moving a bunch of characters at once. If, you, if you're kind of setting up a situation where everybody's sort of traveling together, you can select the whole group 
by using the select tool. Now it'll grab everything that's in there and you can move them all at once. That's pretty handy. Uh, there's a text tool. If you want to drop text in an area, you can drop text in there. You have to make sure that the color is right. You want to make sure that the size is right. And you can essentially apply text as an object and put it wherever you want. So you could say like the inn, the Willowbrook Inn, so that you can sort of label things as you go. So one of the tricky bits about Albert 2.0 is that there are actually a bunch of different kinds of tokens. You have landscape tokens, you have mounts, you have characters, you have attachments. Now, one of these is props. Props is actually pretty handy. So if you go into props and you click add props and you click the add button in the upper right, it gives you some spell effects. These are default spell effects that are included with Albert Rodeo. And you can click these and you get everything from like spheres, cubes, lines, everything like that. And you can click add all. And now those props are in there. Now, they're really good for persistent things. Like, sure, you can use a cone to like figure out whether or not a cone is going to hit. You can sort of drop it on here and say like, okay, that's how big the cone effect is. You can also rotate it to get it like at the right angle that you're going to use. That's fine. That's a little nitpicky for me. But where I do find it useful is if Mohawk Skeleton, for example, has a fire aura around him. I can drop this fire aura. We're going to, that, that aura is pretty big. I have this aura. Now, here's where you, the attach is really important. So I have this object, which is the aura. I also have the object, which is, which is the skeleton. I can uh, take the aura, click on the aura, then click the little three dots at the bottom and say attach and then I click on the skeleton and now the aura follows the skeleton around so as the skeleton is moving around the aura is moving along with the skeleton that's a pretty handy thing that's an Albert 2.0 feature and it's really really nice to be able to do things like this you can do this with lots of other stuff you can create a boat and attach people to the boat uh, you can do a lot of things I'm going to show one last advanced trick that I use for my Shadow Dark role-playing game. And we're going to say they're going to start in these sewers down in the lower right. So we're going to drop the wizard and the rogue. Rogue's going to go up front. The wizard. We're going to say this is the cleric and our fighter. And we've decided that the, wiz the rogue is going to be checking things out, but it's the cleric who's going to have... Uh, be holding a torch. Well, instead of revealing it with boxes to show them where they've been, we can create one single fog revealing shape that looks like the torchlight. So I'm just going to stick the cleric out here so we have room for it. Grab my measuring tool. We're going to say that it goes about 30 feet out. So it should go about that far out. And now I go to the, the, the fog tool. I make a circle and I draw it out to about 30 feet. Now that fog is an object, which means I can click the fog by clicking this little grab. When I click on the fog icon, I can click the grab. I grab the fog object, which means I can now move this around. I'm gonna center it on him, click the three dots, click attach, and attach it to the, the paladin token. And now the paladin token has the torch. And as the characters are exploring the dungeon, they can see what's going on only in the area that they have. Now, there's that problem of can they peer through doors? So let's say they did, this secret is a good example. So they're here and they're like, oh, there's a, I can see it. There's a secret there. What we can do now is draw a shape. So our, we're going to make a new shape. And the shape we're going to have is going to be black so that it's fully, fully translucent. You cannot see through it. We draw a rectangle and we block the view. So this rectangle, and we can make a few of these. If we have a few areas where we're like, yeah, I don't want them to be able to see that part, we can draw these rectangles in to cover up the areas that they can't yet see. And that way, when they are viewing the thing, uh, it looks like this, right? They've, they've got it. Now they might say like, oh, there's something there on that other side. Maybe we should investigate that, but they don't necessarily know. Uh, if they go to this doorway, the, the fog of war only shows them what's up to the doorway. As the GM, we can move those objects to other areas. We can just, you, all you have to do is create a couple of these shapes, put them in the way, then move them away when they see the room, keep them on the map so that you can drop them into any spot to block whatever their view is, wherever they happen to be. You don't have to create 50 of these and block all the rooms out. That's not a lazy technique. A far lazier technique is draw a couple of boxes, get them where you want them, move them around the map, treat them like a sheet of cardboard that you're using to cover things when the, when the map is going. So that is a trick that I've used in my Shadow Dark game. It works really well. Again, I'm able to drop maps in on the fly. We're using the tokens. It works really, really well. 
there are so many advanced features like this. And again, every advanced feature that it has is a, another complication you have to deal with, but some of them really are worthwhile. I love the dynamic torch light for, for Shadow Dark. I love tying tokens to other objects, the torch blockers, but there's lots of other things. Token rings, dice, initiative, other plugins. There's a whole set of extensions that you can add that I'm not talking about today. I will say that the token ring extension is also really valuable. Dice is nice too if you want to have a shared dice roller that everybody can see where you actually see yourselves rolling the dice. I mentioned that there is no Albert Rodeo 1 still. That's not quite true. Mitch and Nicole actually released the original Albert Rodeo uh, as a GitHub repo. So if you are truly nerdy and you want to have your version of Albert Rodeo, th there's two circumstances where this might be useful to you and one requirement. The two circumstances are you really don't like 2.0 and you love the simplicity of 1.0. Two is you want to have your own Albert Rodeo locally because you don't trust that they're going to keep that one up forever and when you want to have your own. And the requirement is that you're awfully nerdy and you're able to set up Docker instances or launch Docker instances on other services and launch your, your VTT there. Because uh, it's not just like an application that you run on your computer. You got to like install software and there's prerequisites and all that kind of stuff. But if you are nerdy, you can get the Albert Rodeo legacy version. It is available for under a non-commercial license. You cannot sell it. Uh, it is a private license that you can use for yourself for nonprofit, non-commercial private use. They do offer instructions for how to launch this thing under a program called Render. Render will take a Docker instance and launch it in the cloud and let you fire it up. I did this yesterday, took a little bit of finagling, was a little tricky to figure out exactly what the URL is that people are going to hit, but it works. So... I hope I gave you a view of how Albert Rodeo 2.0 works and specifically how you can get maps up and running very quickly. My biggest tips for being able to use Albert Rodeo 2.0 for improvisational gaming so quickly that you can actually get maps up and running during your game is to not worry about aligning the grid. Don't you don't even have to necessarily show the grid, turn off snap to grid so that things don't like end up halfway through walls and use the default tokens and you can get really far with Albert Rodeo. Uh, I still love Albert Rodeo. I recognize the extra complications that Albert Rodeo 2.0 added to it, but I do feel like the other features that it added have made it worthwhile. I use it in my games and I love it and I hope you'll give it a shot as well. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more stuff like this, the best thing you can do is subscribe to the Sly Flourish newsletter. It is absolutely free to sign up. You get a weekly RPG related email to your inbox that has links to all of the other things I do and you get a free adventure generator PDF just for signing up. You can also support me directly on Patreon. Patrons get access to uh, the City of Arches source book, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, lots of tools, tips, tricks, and adventures for running great games and it helps me put on shows like this. And you can pick up any of my books, including Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, Lazy DM's Companion, Lazy DM Workbook, Forge of Foes, and all of my fantastic adventure books available on the Sly Flourish bookstore. Thank you so much. Have a great day and get out there and play an RPG.